Okay, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, middle of the night, I, from wherever <clears throat> you are joining this webinar from. We are very delighted to have everyone here and we hope that we are going to, to have an interesting and inspiring session together. Uh, welcome to the webinar on clearing some on, of the highest fair hurdles on PID's metadata semantic interoperability, specifically intended for researchers. This is a second webinar uh, as part of a two-part webinar. The first one was held two weeks ago uh, on the same topics, but it was intended for data stewards and um, and service providers. And if you're interested, the recordings should be on the Face Fair website to have a look. Okay, and I will proceed. Next slide. Um, yeah, the program today, we, we do have uh, three presentations and also two Mentimeters somewhere in between. The first one is by myself. Uh, um, and then uh, the second one will be by Jessica on using persistent identifiers. And then uh, the third one will be by Rob on semantic interoperability and metadata. And we hope that uh, uh, the last half hour will be dedicated to a QA. and a We are going to have two Mentimeters somewhere in between. And um, as part of the introduction, uh, just uh, to, to introduce myself, my name is Lea Ringu Kaliosari. I work at CSC, the IT Center for Science in Finland, but um, also in the Face Fair project where we have a lot of um, um, work going on on FAIR, and uh, I will then move to the next slide. Okay, uh, what I will do in the introduction, I will just do like an elevator pitch on the FAIR is FAIR project, and then I will do a very brief introduction of FAIR principles, and then Jessica and Rob will go into um, um, Jessica will go and Rob will go into the more difficult aspects of, 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 the, of the fair hurdles that we're trying to address. The Face Fair project in a nutshell um, is an Horizon 2020 um, project. Uh, we've been funded uh, with a budget of 10 million starting in March 2019. So we've already been running for two years and um, this is actually our last year. And we have got 22 partners from eight member states and with six core partners, as you can see on, on the screen. Um, the Face Fair project brings together a lot of actors from all across Europe, and we have been working to make uh, EOSC a reality. The main objective is really to help survey the landscape of fair activities in relation to EOSC and identify where dialogue and collaboration can be encouraged. Um, next, okay, um, in a nutshell, we have got seven uh, work packages. Uh, the first uh, work package is uh, on project management, and then there's a work package five that deals with engagement and so on. Then uh, work package two and three deal with uh, policy, uh, practice and policy. Then work package uh, four deals with uh, certification, and then Work package six and seven are dealing with training and education. You are in, we are in work package two, which deals with um, which focuses on fair practices, and in particular, the work we're presenting today is from task two point one, which focuses on technical requirements for fair. The next two presentations will present the results that we published last year in August and. Um, which, which is in the, the second report on fair requirements for persistence and interoperability. The first report was published the year before, 20, 2019. And we also had a well, held a webinar a year ago pre presenting the results, all of which you can find from the project website. If you want to learn more, please visit the website. And if you have any questions regarding the work in Work Package 2, do not hesitate to contact Jessica, who is going to be the next speaker, and she can tell you more about it. She's the Work Package leader. Um, now, on to the FAIR principles. And um, uh, in the middle of this, I'd like to say, if you hear some sounds in the background, 
my children are under quarantine at this point in time. So um, I hope there will, I, because I, I, I have the headset, but I think I'm hearing some noises in the background. So I hope it will not interrupt. So on to the FAIR principles. Quickly, um, I would like to just point out two problems that have, there are many problems that, that um, researchers have to deal with when they're, they're dealing with data, but I'll, I'll just talk about two, two problems that have, have been discussed a lot in the past, say, five years. The first one is the replication or the reprodu reproducibility crisis. It's an ongoing challenge that is affecting a lot of research fields. The scholars have found that um, many scientific studies are difficult or impossible to replicate or reproduce in, on sub, subsequent um, investigation, either by, the, by other independent researchers or by original research, the original researchers themselves. The crisis, it has a long standing, it has long standing roots and the, face, uh, was, the, the phrase was coined in early 2010s as part of a growing awareness of the problem. Today, when fake news and science denialism flourishes on the web a lot, it's important to increase and maintain the trustworthiness of research. So transparency and reproducibility repro become important. The slide here shows um, work that was published in 2016 uh, in a study that was asking researchers how much of their published work can be reproduced. And as you can see, physicists and chemists were the most confident in the literature. Next, another problem is that working with data requires a lot of effort. Research is becoming more and more data intensive as the amount of digital data keeps growing. Collecting and preparing research data is time consuming and takes a lot of skills and insights. Sometimes um, data wrangling, um, which is the process uh, by which we identify, we extract, we clean, we integrate the data, is, it's often cumbersome and it's labor intensive. All this effort should not be thrown away. It should not be wasted. We need to value it. So if it's planned and documented well, it's possible to turn out to turn into uh, the result into a published data set that can be credi credited over time. As you can see on the slide, um, a lot of time and effort goes into cleaning and organizing data. And it's, Im it's important that this effort can, be, can not be wasted, but sort of result into something that can be use useful over time. Um, the FAIR principles, The FAIR principles um, refer to uh, a term that was, the term, I'm sorry, <laughs> now I already have visitors in the room. Bear with me about that. Um, the FAIR principles refer to, um, it refers to a set of guide, guiding principles that make data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. The term FAIR was launched at a Lawrence workshop in 2014, after which the FAIR principles were published in 2016. It's important to note that the European Commission also recommends adherence to the FAIR principles. These principles are technical, and I'm not going to go into the, into the nitty gritty details because Rob and Jessica are going to address most or some of them, but they require a lot of good manage, data management practices along with using services and solutions that are dedicated to research. And as a res we can admit that a single researcher cannot easily be able to manage identifiers and ontologies by themselves. So institutional support is needed in producing sustainable and trustworthy solutions that can be kept running for years and years. Um, to keep things simple for the researchers, um, it would be nice to have a starting point. What does it mean for a researcher to make their data findable? The data needs to be described in a relevant catalog with sufficient information, which means it's nice that the data set also has a landing page and a unique, unique and a global identifier. 
What does it mean for the data to be accessible? It means that the data can be retrieved over the internet and the versioning and life cycle are documented. It's good that there would be a page where even if the data is deleted, something refers to the data. So that sort of the lifeline of, of the data continues. And for the data to be interoperable, it's nice that you can use common and at least well-documented and preferably open formats. Um, for the data to be reusable, the rights and possible licenses need to be clearly stated so that those that reuse the data know the terms within which they can reuse it. And the data needs to be well-documented and understandable. So to keep it short and simple, for the researcher, for the, fair, the fair principles just really mean these concrete things. And to get to a good, uh, you, need, you just need to start at a good base level. But it's important to bear in mind that fair is a journey. So you just have to start from somewhere. Let's take the analogy of the ladder. If a researcher has a data set that is potentially useful, the first step is in reusing the data is to make sure that it can be found. And so you have to make sure that your data is, it, it is findable by other people or by yourself in the future. And those who find it, they need to know how, can, how they can access the data set, possibly including authentication and authorization. And normally the data set would then need to be integrated with other data sets, and that is the I. And in addition, it also needs to interoperate with applications and workflows uh, for analysis, storage, and processing. The ultimate goal of FAIR is to optimize and reuse data. So to achieve this, make sure that metadata and data is well described so that it can be replicated and combined with other different settings. So make the data findable, have it accessible, make sure that it's interoperable so it can be reused. And then you can always repeat the process. How can a researcher then make or create FAIR data? In this simple nine guidelines that just help to you know, create good data management practices, have a good data management plan and pay attention to the FAIR principles, use data formats that are possibly and hopefully open and document and create rich metadata apply metadata standards that um, use vocabularies. And if possible, or it is recommended that you can also use a data repository that also provides persistent identifiers so that your data, your data can, can be referred to, can be found and so on. Also important is to license your data. So, and as always in research, it's important to cite data, whether it's yours or that of others. Um, so having said that, so which part of FAIR is hard? Both FAIR is FAIR and EOSC see that impl implementation of FAIR can be hard. Some things are community specific and others are generic, but we decided that uh, we wanted to address the generic harder issues, um, which we, we addressed in the, in the previous report. And then we see that it's easy to focus attention on the easier aspects where the path and the next steps are clear. But a lot of value can be gained if we deal with the difficult things. And we hope that what we present today will sort of shed a light on some of these hurdles. Um, and now is my time to um, remove myself, to stop my video and to unmute so that we can continue. Is there a, a mentee, Sylvia? I will be uh, trying to switch to the uh, mentee, but uh, my screen is not really collaborating. So one, bear with me for one second. Uh, I think this is the Mentimeter.
but uh, did we lose Sylvia? I think we might have <laughs> lost her. So maybe please, oh. if you all could could go to menti.com and uh, and this code uh, to the yeah the two, two yeah, codes. Thank the you, Tim. Yes. Uh, so what expectations do you have for this webinar? Sorry about that. Uh, I was kicked out, so I'm uh, just back in. <laughs> Thank you okay, for taking so there you, go. you can take over now. I will close my mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so hopefully everyone uh, has it, had an introduction to menti.com. If you went there on your phone or on your computer, you can use the code. I see already a lot of people answering the first question. Uh, it is possible to select multiple answers, and then you have to click on the Send, sending the answers in. Okay. People are not putting any pressure on my part of the presentation there. Okay. Uh, someone is asking for the... Or the link in the chat. Oh. One more W. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, right now I cannot see how many. Uh, 87. Yeah. So 32 have answered. Okay. Let's wait for a couple of seconds more and then uh, we can continue to the next question if needed. Um, but it is clear that uh, most people are interested in, uh, in the three letter options. Um, Okay. More, yeah, more questions. Well, this is nice because uh, we are addressing uh, all three topics here in a little bit more detail uh, after uh, this semantic meter part. Um, Rob, can you uh, go to the next question? Thank you. Um, this is a question about who will. Well, who is responsible for FAIR? Also here you can uh, select multiple answers and then click send. <laughs> I see the first one uh, select it all. <laughs> There's a no right or wrong answer here. And the answer that you think is uh, okay uh, is uh, good enough. There are no prizes, it's not yeah. a quiz. No, no. <laughs> and uh, well, we will, uh, after the, the webinar, we will get uh, uh, anonymized information about uh, uh, the, who is attending these, uh, this webinar. Um, so we will know uh, after the webinar whether this is mostly researchers or not, um, but I think so because uh, apparently you you find yourself responsible, which I think is a good thing. Uh, ah, will the Mentimeter dataset be available? Um, we can make it available uh, after the um, yeah it's it's okay autocorrect. We, we can make <laughs> it available after the webinar on the. Um, uh, yeah, I will, I will work with Rita to, uh, to make it available. It's possible. There's no secrets here. <laughs> um, 41 answered the question. Let's go to the next question. 
what do you already know about this subject? So here can, you can uh, answer in your own words. Um, also, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just for us to know uh, yeah, what your level of understanding is already of, uh, of this subject. And um, with this subject, we mean uh, persistent identifiers, semantic interoperability, um, and PIDs. That's a nice, uh, nice one. You know about the fair principles, but you don't know how to implement them. Well, that's something that we all need to work on. So I, I think that's a nice answer. The types of PIDs, that's also an important uh, observation. It's important to know which types there are. <laughs> we've, we've missed one of the speakers then in the audience. Quite a lot already. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a novice, but work on creating administrative-based data for research. Well, welcome as well. Use of PIDs in repositories, the challenge of interoperability. Yeah, that's definitely a, a challenge. Metadata registration and stewardship. So that's also something that we're going to address. Some people know very little yet, which is also okay. Okay, someone else knows a lot of PIDs, uh, a lot about PIDs and metadata schemas, but doesn't know a lot about ontologies, which is also something that we will address later on. Uh, basic knowledge, I do not know how to implement the F principles, so the FAIR principles. Well, I see a lot of helpful answers, so thank you for that. This is really something uh, useful for us. We, we can work with this also for the next uh, report. We have 29 answers so far. Let's go for one more. And then we can go to the next. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Rob, we can go to the next question. Uh, this is for, uh, uh, for after. Yeah, for after. So maybe you can, if you can go to the question before, the people that didn't answer yet can. Um, uh, can everybody can continue yeah, while the exactly. uh, talks yeah. are going on. Yes. Okay. Then uh, I give the floor back to uh, Jessica now. Okay. Then I'll try to get my browser to show the. <laughs> Come on. Because I want to switch back to the presentation, uh, have to the right slide, and then go okay. back into full screen. One, one moment, uh, Jessica, I'm uh, working on it for you. Thank you. Uh, full screen, <laughs> and then I'll uh, share my remote control to you. Thank you. So uh, there were some comments on PIDs there. And uh, in the last uh, webinar, we talked more from maybe from a service provider point of view and a data steward uh, point of view about uh, implementing persistent identifiers in different contexts. And now, uh, I will be talking about this from a bit more of a, a researcher and user and user point of view. And I will actually not be talking so much about specific uh, persistent identifiers as such, um, but more on a sort of a different principle level about uh, things that we have found in our landscape report and otherwise that how uh, things that we should maybe think about and how, how to address and, and think about persistent identifiers. So now let's see if I can 
switch no yes So first, let's just uh, look at what the persistent identifier is, because actually there are also different different ways of of thinking about persistent identifiers. So, but there is a I think a, a quite common understanding. Uh, we went through a lot of, <laughs> of different documents and definitions when when we did our, our first report. Um, but there is um, generally we say that uh, a persistent identifier is, uh, is a globally it's globally unique really nobody else in the world should use the same string to refer to to some other thing so in practice this means that you need to have a controlled agreed upon syntax what they look like and you need to govern and plan this namespace and and how these uh, Pits are creating and how they how they what they look like. So this means that there needs to be uh, issued and managed uh, that they should be issued and managed by a clearly specified registration authority. Or and there needs to be this ecosystem that manages this. There are are um, of course uh, also discussions about distributed systems, but we won't be addressing them here. Uh, then the persistent identifiers, to be fair, really it should be resolving. So it should provide a way for both machines and humans to access the digital object itself, state of information or an, a landing page. So you should, in practice, if a human user could be, uh, should be able to like click on, on, on this one and it should take you somewhere and the machine should be able to to be taken forwards towards the digital object itself. And then they need to be persistent. So uh, this means that they should stay the same over time. And also the object that they represent should also be persistent and protected against content drift. But you should be really sure whether you are getting the exact same uh, object, if it's a digital object or not. And there's this requires also metadata and that somebody is taking care of this or curating this system over time. So uh, as I mentioned that the, the PID, PIDs should be like identifiable for, as a PID for both the machine and the human. Uh, this is uh, really important that they have this certain structure and usually this, if you look at the, for instance, a DOI, you have this authority where, where you, that also sets the sort of namespace for, for this uh, and, and also decides on, on the schema and the rules of, of how this works, what the format is and, and so forth. And then you have service providers that, that can use and, and uh, allocate these and they have, uh, also this, this prefix uh, so that we can sort of govern and have control over the, the, the so that they really are unique and um, don't, uh, we don't, we shouldn't ever reuse uh, PID. And then the, in the end, there is the PID owner and manager who then are responsible for the suffix, the end of the end part for, uh, for which actually like the exact address and identifies the exact piece and piece of information. This was just an, one example. There are many, many examples, uh, other examples of, of identifiers, but just, just to show that how these are interlinked, the way to manage them and how they look. They, there is a, this connection. Uh, the important thing to remember is that the, once you have published a PID and it's out there, it's a promise you have given that it should be really a PID. If it looks like a PID, it should be a PID. Uh, if this whole system is like built like maybe like money or something, it's built on trust. So if you if you get this 
if people don't, if you can't trust that it works, that the DOI, for instance, really stands for something and, and, and it's persistent, then you lose the whole idea goes, uh, is lost with the PID. So you should be like mindful when you use and create these PIDs and when you publish them. So there's always a cost in the long run. And this is also important to think you can, somebody has to, to keep, keep this thing working once it's on, out there and once somebody has, has pointed to it and used it. So um, then there is this thing with, with whether information uh, contained in the PID and the information around uh, around the persistent identifiers. Usually it's said that the PID and the suffix, especially that they should contain as little semantic information as possible. You shouldn't use like uh, names or, or any, any language, natural language, for instance, in there, because that gets old. And it also, it's always a risk that it creates misunderstandings. Or, or things that you should keep them as uh, it's usually called like they, they should be opaque. But still, I think we, we can't escape that there's always some information in the PID itself because there is the, the sort of the namespace and the, some clue and clues are always included for the human and the machine to identify the PID. Uh, then there is also the kernel metadata about the PID because you need to have in, in tight connection to the PID, the identifier itself, you need to have, for instance, the address where it points to, if it, if it has to, should be re resolved. There are different levels of, of kernel metadata, how much metadata you, you store together with the PID, uh, but a good rule generally is that it should be as minimal as possible. And here the same rule applies that, once you start storing their information, there's always a risk that it gets old or you get conflicts with the things. So the whole idea is sort of that the PID should be as, as uh, contain as little information as possible and also like connected to it. And then the master metadata about the object uh, is then actually somewhere else closer to the object itself. So I keep ticking down too quickly, sorry. So then uh, some words about resolving the PIDs. There are different, different resolving can mean different things. And the one I, I mentioned earlier, like the easy HTTP protocol and how you just click your way through, then you are using the domain name um, service resolvers, which just take you, take you forward to the IP address, but there are resolvers can mean also, and this can be done in other ways to add to the robustness and the persistence of these systems. Uh, we don't maybe don't have to go so far technically into this here. Uh, the point is that in the, um, if we are working with, with we want to create really persistent um, PIDs, uh, it's good to have like also here like the PID having as little information as possible. Generally, um, there often I think uh, is a lot of confusion uh, or there sometimes is confusion around PIDs because PIDs are used in different contexts and use cases and for different uh, needs. And sometimes the this causes a bit of a confusion. So we would maybe like to suggest that we, we keep these different contexts and use cases maybe a bit separate. So there's the context of research information, which is also very relevant for the researcher, why you should be using PIDs, because this is the way that you actually can link yourself, your ORCID PID, to your publication DOI, you can link it to your research project, another RAID or something, you can use it to, to your data set. And, and this way metadata can be linked into these big graphs that can be used for, for searching, for citation. You can also uh, 
create uh, links or graphs with citations and this really enhances the findability and it also makes it makes good uh, information about uh, research what the ongoing research is but there is also another context and this is the actual uh, management of the research process itself during the research life cycle and this is sometimes an other a bit of a different context and they are of course linked but uh, you might want to have like uh, PIDs for your instruments to manage the, them and the information about them you might want to have a PIDs for the variables you use or some kind of other um, uh, these kinds of describing information. You might want to have uh, PIDs for your data on different points. Uh, you might want to have um, PIDs for your workflows or protocols. You want to uh, manage maybe with PIDs um, your code. And then of course you want to have the PID <laughs> yourself. Uh, the ORCID so that you can be persistently and uniquely and securely identified over time and connected to all this. And then this sort of way uh, you uh, can get, get also from there the, the visibility. And these are then linked, uh, for instance, with that data citation, you can link the, the research information and the research data use. Then when we are looking at different, and this was also something that was very obvious when we did a landscape survey, that the sort of how you implement FAIR in different domains and research contexts and research cultures, there are great differences in what's really cost efficient and smart to do. Do you want to actually have machine actionable data, metadata, PID, do you want, uh, or is it maybe not necessarily, or maybe you want to have a more shallow, a shallow fare, and it's uh, good enough if the metadata is machine readable and findable, and you have the PID there. So there are like different, different contexts, and then sometimes they all come together in the data citation. So if you look at the research uh, process and life cycle, there are like different versions. You usually work with different types of data. You have the active operational data, it's raw data. Uh, it might be changing and it's no point of giving a PID necessarily as to it necessarily. This might differ. Uh, maybe it's still just uh, temporary data that it's not no point storing. Maybe there is, maybe not. Uh, do you want to cite it or not? Then you have the generic research data, which can be like dynamic and it's really good quality control research data. Uh, here, you already are thinking about citations and creating, uh, for instance, version database or something so that you can cite this. And then we have the research dataset publication, which is like a, an output put from a specific research question, uh, which is, I think, for instance, if you look in Zenodo, many research data sets, there are, are results of a certain investigation or research question, and not always that easy to reuse because the data has been sort of created for a certain research uh, question. And, and then if you would like to have a reproducible <laughs> research, you would be need, think, need to think about this, where, how do you cite and what should be machine accessible, what should be really stored, kept, and, and how should this whole system work? And this is really, really uh, different in different um, research domains and regarding re different types of research data. And this all affects the ways where you, where you want to create the, the PIDs and, and where we're not. So um, regarding this green data or the evolving data sets and citations, there are some recommendations by, by, by the RDA. Uh, 
that you should version. You can also give PIDs to queries. Uh, you can archive certain subsets uh, and give that a PID if you if you use that. But it, there are different ways, and this can uh, be quite um, extensive if you if you really have a, a database where you want to do reproducible research and. And you should, I think, be quite mindful. It's quite easy then to, to create lots of PIDs. And uh, it might be really useful and a really good way to manage. But then you should be thinking about the, the cost also in the long term. So what's what's like actually smart, a smart way to manage this? So I don't have an answer for this. But this is just a dimension to think about. Um, just, uh, I think it, it, it's useful to consider cost and sustainability and thinking of, about in what, what, when, when you actually meet, meet the PIDs and when are some other kinds of identifiers enough. So it's often when you talk about PIDs also that we have to think about the sort of balance uh, in providing, we have the, the own culture of the designated community, which your own research community, what the culture is and what, what the needs are and what is considered good enough, um, good enough for reproducibility or persistent, uh, how, how long is data supposed to be available and so forth. So it's very uh, interrelated with all of these things. And then you always, have this advantage of, of if you really have used PIDs, you have this uh, persistence and you can create also this interoperability across domains, which is we have to strike, strike this balance. So if we are looking at, at when you, when actually what do you want to, pro to give PIDs to, uh, you need to think about your own, the ontology of the, the research uh, field, uh, what you are looking at. What is, for instance, the granularity you need to give PIDs to which all levels of information, uh, which are the relations between the, the different entities that you want to manage if we now think about the research, research uh, picture with the researcher who manages the all kind of code and instruments and, and how are these related? What do you need to, to be able to to have really these unique persistent resolvable identifiers that you can, can then maybe also share with others to, to enhance interoperability. Uh, so do you want to, to give the PIDs to the instruments and, and so forth and code and, and how, how does this work within your domain and maybe then are there solutions uh, uh, in other other domains that can you could then be benefit from. Then another thing about thinking, which I just want to repeat, is this thinking about the life cycle, uh, about the data um, and the things you give PIDs. Are they really are they temporary things, or are they things that you really uh, need to keep and for how long? Because once you have the PID, you need to have the landing page and the metadata like accessible. And it's often smart <laughs> to have that, of course, but, but uh, if you have like billions and billions of these that nobody would ever use and you don't have the objects, maybe it's not necessary or a good idea to publish them. So this is something to think about the requirements also. And then the use cases. And I, here I especially want to point to the, the reproducibility and the data citation in your own field and your own domain and uh, your designated community, what are the requirements and how, how are you expected to, to provide citations? So where do you mean the PIDs and, and uh, what are, are, are the requirements raising from that uh, sort of making good, good research and research that is fair and, and uh, fair compliant and transparent and reproducible. And it var this varies. So I just want to end by with this, like uh, that remember this, that the PID is a promise. 
we should publish it. Uh, that somebody has to take care of, of, of the PID. So choose these trusted repositories and, and uh, use the expertise you have, have available and existing PID systems and services. So I think this was my part. So now I hand over to Rob. That's a lot of buttons that I need to press to get control of my own uh, slides again. Let's see. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Doing a lot that uh, does not help me to get set up right. Uh, this one back into full screen mode for you. And uh, one slide back. Come on. No, it's uh, not cooperating. Okay, so uh, I will be uh, giving you a little bit more of an introduction in uh, semantic interoperability. And to uh, first place semantic interoperability on the map, uh, you've already seen this layered cake. Uh, there are uh, frameworks for interoperability. Uh, this is the uh, a drawing coming from the European interoperability framework, which is officially government data primarily for government data, uh, and it uh, identifies four different layers. So it has a layer called technical interoperability, uh, semantic interoperability, organizational interoperability, and legal interoperability. So uh, we are uh, talking in this, uh, in our report, mostly about semantic interoperability. Of course, all four are very important if you want to be uh, make, make sure there is uh, interoperability. But uh, we are uh, especially interested in semantic interoperability, which is the kind of interoperability that makes us understand data the same way. So. Uh, the, if you want to know what can go wrong if you uh, do not understand things the right way and you do not know this movie, then uh, please make sure that you uh, look up the presentation afterwards and click on this uh, YouTube video. It's only three or four minutes and it will show you everything that can go wrong in the interpretation of, uh, of a data set by uh, uh, other researchers, but also by the group where the data set originated. I'm not going to play it here I'm not going to use that time but if you haven't seen it ever before it is really worth showing what the kind of problem we are trying to solve so uh, if you've ever failed in the data management plan as a researcher then you know that uh, one of the primary questions in there is what type of file formats are you using uh, what i what this slide is trying to help you see is that this is not solving the, uh, the, the, the semantic interoperability problem. Standard file formats are mostly a technical interoperability issue. Um, and I gave here a few uh, examples of file formats and why it doesn't solve the interoperability problem. So PDF is, for instance, a standard file format, but machine you reader, uh, machines cannot read it. So there is no uh, reusability there. Uh, Comma separated values, CSV files are often produced, but in themselves do not save the day because the information could be anything. A CSV file containing weather data uh, looks exactly the same as a CSV file uh, with patient data. You really need to know what each column and each row means before it makes sense to you. And uh, similarly, SPSS doesn't guarantee that the data is understandable either. And that the name of the program doesn't also guarantee the name of the data format. So we need something more to uh, establish semantic interoperability. And uh, that is the content of the data. So we need to make sure that all the content is unambiguous. What does that mean? Well, some words mean different things to different people. So we can actually, if we're talking about, about something, we can think that we understand the same, but we can actually misunderstand each other. This is a very obvious example, but this plays a role at many different levels in, uh, in understanding. So uh, a plant could be a, a, a chemical factory, uh, but to a biologist, of course, it's something that grows in the soil. 
So the content is, uh, is uh, 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 important because of the terms, but also numbers need to be uh, uh, disambiguated. So what does that mean? Well, uh, if we have a, a temperature, uh, if we're talking about the temperature of 32, then we need to know which unit it is. Uh, if pe two people talk about 32 degrees and one is thinking in Fahrenheit, he may be feeling very cold, the other one feeling uh, very hot because he thinks in Celsius. So to, in order to make sure that we can't misunderstand the data, we need to include the unit. And there, that's uh, one, uh, two things. The third thing is really that uh, sometimes data files contain uh, empty fields and we need to make sure that we know what uh, these empty fields mean. And in, in other cases, zero or an, uh, uh, a missing value or minus one can even uh, mean something special. And by documenting the data and the data files, we really need to make sure that it is impossible to misunderstand the, uh, the data. So uh, it needs to be mis impossible to misunderstand it for a user of the data. But who is that user? That user could be you right now. And of course, you have a lot of uh, hidden knowledge about the information. You in five years may already have forgotten a lot of uh, the data and uh, the, the metadata, the description. Uh, what did I do back then? Why did I use that special code? Uh, what unit did I use? Um, a coworker, of course, you would need to explain something, but it becomes more difficult even when it's somebody from a similar lab elsewhere, or when we really want to make in interoperable data and want to merge data with other data of other research types, then uh, somebody who is integrating your data with other data uh, probably has a need of a lot more uh, context to make sure that he understands the data correctly. Misunderstandings multiply with this scale. So if I go back to this scale, if uh, both these people are plant biologists, then they are talking about ambient temperatures. But if one is a doctor, then temperature may mean body temperature or ambient temperature. And even if there are two doctors, then body temperature could be measured in different ways. And if you don't remember whether it was measured on the tongue or under the armpit, then they really could be different for certain purposes. Be very, very explicit if you want to do uh, uh, semantics. This is, this is really semantics. Now, this is uh, why, uh, but also how. Uh, let's discuss a solution. So the FAIR principles in themselves, the paper of 2016 does not make any choices. Uh, but if you look at uh, the, the people who wrote that, actually, they had a, uh, a possible solution in mind, and that's linked data. Linked data technologies are a very good uh, technical implementation of, uh, of these uh, interoperability things in the FAIR principles. They describe uh, relationships and properties of things, and instead of uh, terms that could need would need to be translated and that can change, they use URIs or, or even PIDs to refer to certain concepts. Um, there are very there is a very broad application of these tools as well, and that makes it possible that a, a tool that is developed in one field is really used in another field as well. So uh, visualization, uh, all kinds of things that every researcher in their field need to do can be reused uh, if they're all based on the same uh, RDF or uh, linked data technology. I already spilled some beans for uh, for where we're going there. Um, so. This is an example of uh, both relationships and properties. So you see the relationship between uh, two people, Alice and Bob is a knowing relationship. A relationship between Alice and John is a father relationship. And the other thing is then daughter, of course. So let's say that you can draw arrows in different directions and describe relationships. And you also see here a property. So the, one of the properties of Bob is that his birth date is somewhere in 1994. In uh, uh, the linked data uh, world, this, uh, these, these lines with two bubbles are uh, called triples, and these triples all have a subject. That's what it is describing. 
a, a predicate, that's a relationship, and an object, which is the, uh, the, the property or the relationship, where the relationship is going to. So here it's the same. It's a subject, a predicate, the birth date, and the object is the actual birth date. And the idea actually is that any kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge, can be represented in the form of these kind of triples. Uh, what we want to do is, of course, not use strings. So these are, uh, this is Richard, but we don't know which Richard. We don't want to use strings. Actually, we are using URIs to point to a particular web uh, page that describes a certain Richard. That is, that is the trick. So each of these actually have uh, uh, persistent identifiers associated to them. Now, if you compare the triples to a table of data, then it doesn't uh, only define what is in each row and each column and each value, but it also defines explicitly what all the relations between the columns are. Uh, if you have, if you would have a table with a with patients, then you can have a ta table, the patient IDs. You can have a, a disease in another column and a medication. Then you can have a description uh, of where the medication comes from. Uh, is is the medication actually meant to to cure that disease? This is all made explicit if you are using these triples. Usually, this kind of thing is not given when you are making a table, and it's it is actually uh, uh, tacit knowledge, and that limits interoperability. It limits the understanding. So we need to go there. So what kind of technologies are there? Uh, the RDF, as I already mentioned, is one of the standards in here in a whole stack where uh, the bottom is made by these uh, universal uh, research uh, locators, um, uh, identifiers. Um, so the identifiers are at the bottom. There is uh, RDF to indicate the triple relationships. And there are a lot of other standards to actually query that, to describe the relationship between these. Uh, and all of these, there are special tools for, uh, for that, that make it reusable for every RDF data set in, uh, in the world. Now, it, it, so uh, linked data is often said that it is schemaless uh, in a database table, tables, database tables, you need to describe exactly what you are going to make, and then uh, you can fill the data. Uh, and RDF triples are schemaless. You can put any kind of triple into your uh, triple database. The problem then is, of course, if you want to query that data, you still need to know what kind of information is in there. And also for that, there are standards. Recently, this is done in uh, is called the shape control language, and that's uh, Shackle, and it's it's a, a a way to describe what kind of data you can expect in a graph of triples. So uh, this is just a, a warning. Although I just said that RDF is a very good technology, uh, this is not a call for you to transform all of your data into RDF. You could uh, describe, for instance, a JPEG image uh, as RDF, giving it uh, a, a million pixels. And each of those million pixels has an X coordinate as a property, a Y coordinate as a property, a red, a green, and a blue value, maybe a transparency. That is going to be a huge data set that is absolutely useless to, uh, to work with. If you are working with images, then most likely your software can use these images and the form of images, and you should keep them as images. But for most other data that is not so structured and is not so standard, it is very handy to have the information in the form of RDF triples and then be able to retrieve. So your conclusions can be described in RDF, uh, uh, a lot of metadata can be described in RDF, but the bulk of the data you should probably not uh, put in RDF. Uh, I think I'll uh, simply uh, skip this one in the, in the view of time and uh, tell you a, a, little bit, a little bit of a summary for uh, how semantic interoperability is important for, uh, for machines. So if, if, you, uh, if you use human language and we describe data in a human language, then uh, we, uh, 
mis can have misinterpretation. I showed you that a unique identifier really helps, and that is uh, semantic interoperability uh, to the top. Um, you need to be specific in the data types and document everything so that uh, misunderstandings are avoided, so then also computers, machines can understand it. In order to do that, the textual values are actually frowned upon, and it's much better to use semantic artifacts, as they're called, ontologies, uh, vocabularies that limit the number of, of possible values. So rather than having a string for the gender, you just say uh, point to a, an option where you can either select male or female if that is the option, or something wider if that is uh, necessary for your study. Having all of those uh, semantic artifacts actually fair themselves is also uh, an, a necessity for fair. And uh, there is another task in uh, FAIR is FAIR, in FAIR is FAIR, FAIR uh, uh, work package two as well. Uh, they, they delivered the deliverable 2.5 that describes how these FAIR semantics are, uh, are best arranged. So closing off the, uh, the semantics part of this talk, um, researchers can help with the FAIR interoperability by using the open standards that exist for data and metadata uh, formats by using shared and curated semantic artifacts, those ontologies, code lists, and uh, vocabularies. And uh, also by, if they no yet exist, supporting the creation, curation, and linking of these first semantic artifacts. And then of course, use sh uh, shared protocols and registers for the data types so that everything really becomes interoperable that my, degrees Celsius are the same, uh, are understood as being the same as your degrees Celsius. So that brings me to the next part. And I don't have to switch uh, spe speakers now because I will straight go on into the metadata. And uh, I start the metadata section of this talk with a quote from a, an, an actress. Uh, Jean Harlow once said, don't give me books for Christmas. I already have a book. And uh, this is very applicable also to metadata. Uh, so you could say, don't ask for metadata. My data, met, data set already has metadata. But uh, if you look at the FAIR principles, actually, I highlighted here the word metadata. You see that it occurs many times. And not all of these copies of the word metadata are actually talking about the same metadata. So if the uh, data management plan questionnaire asks you which metadata standards will you use and it gives you the options, use the Dublin core or use dip discipline specific standards, then you can directly conclude, I will need both. You need the Dublin core for some kind of findability, but you need discipline specific standards also for the understanding of the data. So, in, uh, so I, I, I put some arrows here now uh, for, for indicating the different kinds. So uh, metadata are registered in indexed in a searchable resource. Those are metadata that are meant for findability. That can be uh, your name, uh, the title of the study, uh, that can be a, a study number, grant number, but it can also be really uh, topics that the study is about so that machines will be able to find it. Uh, or even columns in, that are in your database, identifiers for columns in your database. Uh, for interoperability, yeah, then you really need to have those vocabularies and the data that we just talked about in semantic interoperability. Uh, and uh, it needs uh, the, the right kind of format to, uh, to be able to do that. So this is another kind of metadata. And for reusability, again, the metadata is different. It, it talks about our usage license. It talks about provenance. Where does the data come from? How, is, how was it produced? And uh, domain relevant community standards. So, so many data sets really need to be annotated with uh, indications on what, what kind of result you can expect. Uh, if you have a satellite image, just having the, the uh, ID that it's a satellite image is not enough. You want to probably know things like the resolution, the wavelength at which this uh, satellite image was made. And then somebody reusing that image can decide whether they find that useful for their study. 
So those, uh, the, those domain relevant community standards, they need to be built together with researchers who know the field and data scientists who know how to make those kind of uh, uh, resources. So a metadata standard really consists of two parts. Uh, uh, optional is the format, but as we've talked about in the semantic interoperability part, it's much more important what is in there, what is actually described in there, the fields. So each field has a definition, often and this, or this needs to be human readable, and we hope then that the computers uh, can be programmed to, uh, to understand them. Uh, each field often uh, has a priority. It's either obligatory, it's recommended, or it's optional. And then uh, you uh, specify which ontology or vocabulary is used to answer the, uh, uh, the issue. Um, it, of course, you could try to minimize your work by only using the obligatory ones, but the reusability of your data set really improves if, the, if you also fill in the recommended and optional fields of a, a metadata standard. And the general idea is don't throw metadata away. If for a medical study, you study a, a population of, uh, of people uh, and uh, for the analysis, it is necessary to know what the average age, age is, then you could say the average age is a metadata item. But to calculate the average age, actually you needed the distribution. And it is a waste if you throw that distribution away because somebody reusing your data set may want to know whether it's a narrow or a wide distribution and, and not have enough with only the average. So any metadata you have, try to add it. It can be helpful for reusers later. So how to find metadata standards? There are def definitely many different ways. There is a repository called fair sharing. There is the uh, metadata directory of the RDA. There is in the US uh, a technology called CDAR from the metadata center uh, that uh, can be uh, of help not only to find existing metadata standards, but also to build them together in a community. And then there is the component metadata infrastructure, the CDMI. And of course, you can find these links when you download the slide set yourself later. Finishing this off, you know, how can researchers support metadata? They have to choose trustworthy services that enable fair data. Um, use open and shared ontologies and standards for metadata. They have to create rich metadata. And not only the mandatory or minimal ones, although the standards are called minimal information about MIA often, please don't use them uh, to minimize the metadata, but to maximize it. And then uh, follow the guidelines and application profiles for, uh, for whatever project you're in. And now we are going back to Sylvia and to Menti. Yes, so you so. can take your phone or your second screen or browser or whatever. And go back to the Menti. Uh, you can stay in the same Menti as we used before. Uh, we will close this uh, question now and go to the next. Uh, let me see so where. Yes. Yes. Okay. So seven people already <laughs> quickly answered the, the first question before. Uh, this is also a, a question where you can select multiple answers. Um, so what do you think is more important, interoper interoperability in your designated domain or interoperability across all domains? Uh, I mean, yeah, we are curious what you think. So let's see, give people a little bit of time to uh, answer. It's not far apart so far. I think uh, interop interoperability in your designated domain is, is very important. Uh, it should be there first, but we'll see what uh, other people think. Oh, uh, the link to Menti is also on the screen. I will also type it 
in the chat again. Someone asked for it again. Yeah, and Bonnie says in the chat that she thinks the first one, but eventually all. I think that's also a good uh, answer. So we have 33 answers now. Uh, I think we, can, for the sake of time, we can go to the next question. This is uh, a question you can skip um, parts if you uh, need to. You can answer them all or just a couple. Um, so this is about what you feel is most important for uh, should be the most important focus for our new report. Um, so should it be more about persistent identifiers or semantic interoperability or metadata or support and adoption of the above? So uh, the first person thinks it's uh, all. <laughs> Some other people uh, think that it can be a little bit less about persistent identifiers, which is okay. A little bit more about semantic interoperability and metadata. But most think uh, support on all of the above is also important. Yeah, if we're nearing 30, then I'm happy. And we can do the final question. Yeah. So uh, which unanswered questions are you left with? So we have had uh, the webinar now, we've had all the talks. Are there still questions that you feel uh, need to be addressed? Or are there questions that you think are relevant for maybe the next report? Uh, you can type this in the textbook and we will leave this um, open so you can answer it uh, after the webinar as well for some time. And I see in the chat someone has responded. It will be very instructive to see an example of how to verify a typical messy research data set. I will use that. Uh, Remark for our next report as well. Thank you. So uh, as an answer to that, I would uh, say, uh, watch the uh, YouTube movie that I had uh, linked. Uh, that is a very messy data set and you will immediately understand uh, what needs to be done. And you can also see that the, uh, the first steps really don't have to be uh, very hard. If you know what kind of problems can uh, people can run into when they are reusing a data set, and uh, this is a disaster scenario shown in the movie, but you will uh, very easily be able to, uh, to do much better than that. And the trick really is in thinking about it and then just making the first step. Nobody expects you to do everything at the same time. Um, okay, I, I also see uh, questions in the Q&A, uh, Rob and uh, Jessica. Uh, there's a question from Adam. Um, well, it's, not, it's more an observation, I think, but he says, arguably the semantic web failed as it is impossible to construct one agreed global taxonomy. So how do you address the need to join up vocabularies across domains? Well, we, we have the, the task on fair semantics. Also in our work package where they are working with the recommendations for semantic artifacts, like yeah, vocabularies and ontologies and how to make them fair. But that's also like one layer Then we maybe want to, to link them and make these uh, mappings and crosswalks that also then would be needed, needed to manage, be managed <laughs> and curated and kept up to date. I think that we sort of need to accept that we have a lot of uh, legacy data and we have also all kinds of domains and they need to have their own vocabularies, but we can try to link, link them. And I, I think this, this technology also really makes that available for us. So, so we don't have to try to produce 
standardized data over the world that would kill all innovation. I mean, we, we need to, to build these layers of semantic interoperability in, in between. And that's a huge piece of infrastructure. I think that it's, it's emerging in, in some domains, but not everywhere. Well, I, I can also uh, comment comment on it uh, a little bit. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't think uh, it is a sign that semantic, uh, semantic web failed. Uh, it is impossible to make a single taxonomy that really uh, uh, captures all the knowledge in the way everyone understands it. It is necessary to describe things in different ways. I worked in, uh, in industry for quite a while and uh, in the R&D department, we made descriptions of how a, how an, uh, a piece of equipment was built. Uh, so uh, you, you describe an instrument that is built out of a, a source and a, a robot and a detector and, uh, and these things work together. So with each of them consists of further components that consist of further components. And it's a whole taxonomy. And this whole taxonomy, we thought, was the universal truth. And then we would send the whole design to the production department. And the first thing they would do was completely throw over the taxonomy and start from a production point of view. And in a production point of view, you don't want somebody to run through the parts store to get two little screws and then five minutes later find out that in another part of the tree they need two more of those screws so they bunch together things into buckets saying okay you need to get four screws of this and five screws of that and for that they rebuilt the taxonomy of the whole instrument that was to be built so you see that it's really necessary to have different taxonomies and in the same way in science so a biologist sees two chemicals like uh, uh, vitamin c and uh, uh, sodium ascorbate they are, for a biologist, they are the same, because if you take them, they both release ascorbate in your blood. And it does have exactly the same biological effect. To a chemist, those two are completely different. To a pharmacist, they may be even more different because one is more quickly available. And so they dissolve quicker when they're in your stomach. So that, that's uh, uh, yet, yet another view. All these taxonomies need to be different. They are interpretations of reality. And then, as Jessica said, we need to be able to link them together to make scientific understanding. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, Adam, I hope this answer uh, is uh, uh, agreeable for you. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, let us know in the chat. I will uh, uh, close this uh, question now. Okay. Yeah. And it, yeah, there was this question from Edward Jacob about the uh, topic maps, and I think that's uh, an, sort of another le level <laughs> than we've been discussing here. I think it's a, a method of in doing an implementation. So it's, but he's asking for maybe some other uh, experience of that. So maybe you can get in touch with with Edward if you have been working with those methods. Yeah. Um, okay, I will have a look at uh, a couple of the unanswered questions. Do researchers really need to understand that, uh, how semantic interoperability works? Shouldn't infrastructure be responsible for enabling that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but they can't do it. Uh, I mean, working at an, at an RI. It's, um, we really need the input of the researchers to be able to describe the, the ontology that, uh, yeah, uh, Robert just was explaining. So, so we need to be cooperating and researchers should be, of course, asking for this and demanding for, for the persistent identifiers and the tools to, to make uh, the semantic artifacts to create this and, and rich enough metadata and should be communicating to the data stewards and the service providers if they, they don't have the sufficient tools. So, but, but yeah, we, um, this is going to be happening better and faster if, if the researchers <laughs> uh, raise their voice and, and discuss this. So this is, this really needs to, has to be a 
sort of common effort, I think. Yeah, you cannot create it once and then think it's done. Science evolves, so uh, your specific field of science may require also extensions. So, uh, for instance, uh, I've once seen people complaining that uh, they, they are studying the liver and uh, there is an ontology of all the different cell types in the human body. But it was not detailed enough. It has only three or four different liver uh, cell types. And if you are specialized in that, you may need 25 different liver cell types. So you need to be able to extend this kind of ontologies. And that's where, where you need the knowledge of how uh, what is important and, and how it is done. And this is done together with people who are expert in, uh, in building this kind of knowledge models. Yeah, I also th feel that one, one like difficult thing in this, like discussing this is that to be able to discuss this on a common level that everyone can relate to, it becomes automatically quite abstract. So it's very difficult to give a, like a common <laughs> recommendation who all researchers could like implement like this. So it's, it's sometimes the discussion becomes quite abstract and, and it really, yeah, it's often I think it's just like raising these points about how you should think about these things and, and then try to yeah, discuss with the, the data stewards and services how to find the, the correct implementations and solutions that really serve you. There's also a, a question of Richard Dennis in the chat. He asks, which data repositories open source currently support semantic interoperability? Uh, I, uh, I can take a crack at this, but this uh, is very hard to, to answer. So uh, semantic interoperability, you can do at many different levels. So if you would describe indeed data in uh, triples, then this can end up in uh, an RDF file, uh, which can be encoded in different ways. There's, for instance, a turtle file that's quite quite readable if you uh, look at it. And so such turtle files, you can just put in Zenodo. Of course, uh, the level of support you get from Zenodo is, is minimal for that. Um, so uh, I, at a higher level, I don't know. At the, the highest level uh, would be that uh, you have a, uh, what is called a Sparkle interface to your data where queries can uh, directly be done on the data from the repository. Uh, but I don't think many repositories would be able to, uh, to support that directly. And Jessica, do you have any any other views on that? No, no. I, I I think also it's it's really. I mean, the thing is that you you need to maintain, and as you mentioned, that the, the science it develops and the world develops, and and uh, it's it's challenging to to find find the right right um, level to operate on. But we have have repositories supporting semantic operability, I think. And I mean, there are, are services that have really, really, really good, like on a really <laughs> a fine level, deep fair level, like metadata. Yeah, so the, met, the, the format of the metadata is, the, is where most of the repositories actually are going very, uh, very well. And standards have been developing over a very long time. Uh, what you see is that uh, uh, many of them still use keywords, for instance, uh, rather than terms from an ontology. Uh, and this, this is... Uh, not completely uh, semantically interoperable. It makes it a lot more difficult for machines to uh, to understand what is uh, what is going on, and also they are uh, language dependent. So, uh, moving towards the future, I think more and more uh, uh, levels of semantic interoperability will will be supported by more uh, repositories. Okay. Um, yeah. There was also here a comment about the re reuse of data and reusability of data. And I think this is also um, really, I mean, it's easier to reuse this kind of generic research data set that's sort of produced for research on a generic level. 
then these kinds of uh, outputs from specific research questions, which are a difficult. And I think it would be really valuable to sort of give credit to these different types of works with data. And we are going towards that with the credit taxonomy and also, also you should really be credit Give, be given credit for for creating good research data that is like generic and and kept up to date and interoperable. So, so I see I see a lot of yeah. so there are lots of questions about uh, pr practical uh, showcases uh, demonstrating uh, what what we've just been uh, talking about. So uh, this is something that we really will take into account for the next year of our work. Okay. Uh, do we want to try and see if we want to answer another question that is unanswered, or uh, do we want to uh, finish? I think we, we want to close. It's uh, almost time. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I think we can also stop the recording. Uh, for uh, yeah, uh, Leia, do you want to uh, say some closing words? Closing words with lots of noise in my background. Well, um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for your presence here um, and very uh, active uh, participation. And thanks for your feedback, for your questions. We will, as, as Rob has said, we are going to write another report, the last one, uh, that is due before the end of the project. So this year we will spend on making hopefully we can bring in more practical examples about how to get fair into practice yeah um this is it for me and if you have any questions please feel free to contact us and with respect to work package two jessica is our work package leader she can answer all your questions but also welcome to the face fair website and there's lots happening i hope that you would be able to to get the information. We have sent some links about the previous, um, there was a question about the previous webinar and I, I sent the link, it, it should now be already there. Um, yeah, this um, is- Yeah, I me. asked whether the um, presentations from today and the video will be um, available also on the Fairs Fair event page related to this event. Thank you. Great. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And we hope to uh, meet you another time, uh, maybe even uh, live once uh, in one of our meetings. But otherwise, uh, you're welcome at our webinars. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, bye you. Bye. thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.